we know that the world, the modern world, runs on oil, refined oil, to produce gasoline, which is the energy that runs our cars, and to produce materials like plastics and pesticides, pharmaceuticals. We also know that there's an extreme environmental cost to using a non-renewable source of energy, a source that degrades the climate through the production of greenhouse gases, as well as other pollutants that degrade the quality of life. We know this. It's obvious. And the truth is that we have to consider alternatives to oil if we want to live a sustainable life, a life that future generations can appreciate, that does not damage or degrade the life support systems of the planet. And it's not about peak oil. It's not about running out right now because there's a lot of oil in the ground. It's about finding a sustainable alternative to extract energy and material from the world around us at reduced environmental costs. So how do we, how do, we do that? Well, there are a number of technological approaches that are being discussed that are supposed to help us make the transition. Everything from solar power to electric cars. And you've heard about some of these ideas today. What I want to do is offer you a biological solution. One that does involve invisible microbial communities. And now microorganisms, as you heard, are teeny tiny single-celled life forms. They've been around for billions of years, and during that time they've evolved very efficient ways of obtaining energy and materials from their surroundings through cooperative interactions. So the question is, can we replace this type of scenario in our lives that's fueling the modern world with something more sustainable using the microbial world as our source of inspiration? So how do we do that? Well, we can harness the cooperative power of microbial communities to engineer the solutions we need right now. I mean it, right now, not tomorrow. Right now, to reverse centuries of environmental damage and evolve, literally evolve, towards a more sustainable state on planet Earth in which we can live in harmony with the way that nature works. But in order to get there, we have to understand how microbial communities cooperate to adapt and survive in the world. And we have to take those organizing principles and we have to learn to engineer with them. We have to learn to build biological systems, literally, that do the kinds of things we want to do to extract energy and materials from the environment in a sustainable way. So, to get there. The first idea is that we live in a microbial world. And so I want you to appreciate and a little bit of history here, how we've come to know about this microbial world and how it influences our future. So when you think of biological diversity, you probably think of plants, you probably think of animals, or maybe insects. And you probably have this image of a pie chart that shows all the different types of life that lives on Earth, the things that you can see. And when Darwin was coming up with his theory of evolution, he was traveling through the Galapagos Islands and he was observing different life forms across the different islands, the chain. And he was using the appearance of those life forms. Here you see these finches with different beaks as the basis for understanding heredity, for understanding the relationships among organisms. But in 1953, something shifted. And this is when Watson and Crick solved the structure of DNA. Okay, they determine the precise order of the G's, the A's, the T's, and the C's, the bases that make up the basis of uh, the genetic code. Now, the genetic code, of course, is this archive of evolutionary information that binds all living things together. We're part of that. And technologies have been developed that enable us to read that genetic code and to decode it. So since the time of 1953, scientists have gone around the world, it's almost a frenzy, sequencing every living thing imaginable. Okay, not just the plants and the animals and the insects, but things like soil and water. Imagine that, extracting DNA directly from the environment. And one of the most profound things, I think, to come out of this, and it might be a surprise to you, I don't know, it was a surprise to me, is that microorganisms are the invisible majority 
of living things on earth. They're the dominant life force. They've always been and will probably continue to be. There are more microorganisms on the planet at any given time than all the cells in all our bodies, all the synaptic connections in all our brains. There are more microbes on the planet at any given time than the stars in the known universe. Not only are they abundant, but they're incredibly diverse. And another thing you have to understand is that the vast majority of this invisible majority are not domesticated. Okay, they're wild. They live in nature. We don't know how to grow them. We only know about them as their existence on the basis of that sequence information that we can obtain. And so the question is, how, what do we do with that knowledge? How do we take that forward? Well, one way is to think about microorganisms like cells in the body of an ecosystem. And when I talk about an ecosystem, I'm including our own bodies as an ecosystem where microorganisms can live and thrive, or the surface of the ocean. And microbial communities living in these ecosystems, working together, cooperating, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, actually create the conditions and sustain the conditions for life. And they've been doing this for three and a half billion years. They've been really successful. In fact, one could argue that this microbial majority that you see represented here has engineered the planet. In fact, engineered the planet over geological time to enable you and me to be here today. And so I want to give you an example of how we know this. Okay, what you're seeing is an image of the Earth from a NASA satellite that detects chlorophyll fluorescence. Okay, chlorophyll is the photosynthetic uh, pigment that absorbs light energy, right? And the satellite can see that. And you're looking at the ocean, and you're seeing there's variation over time in chlorophyll in the ocean. I want, to wa I want you to watch the Pacific Ocean as the Earth turns right now. You're going to see a pulse across the Pacific. Did you see that? You just watched the planet breathe. You watched microbial communities in the surface ocean perform photosynthesis. They took sunlight, they took carbon dioxide, they took water, they produced oxygen, and they produced sugar. Of course, that sugar is the basis for the food web in the biological system in the ocean. So not only do they create the atmosphere that we need, but they're providing the basis, the ecological basis for nutrition in the ocean. Interestingly enough, I don't know if it's ironic, but all that microbial life that's being produced under those conditions, where do you think it winds up when it dies? It sinks to the bottom of the ocean. And over long periods of time, it becomes oil, right? So if we could only find a way to speed that process up, we could overcome the need for the oil, the fossil fuel that's in the ground, because we could take this bioreactor, this ocean paradigm, and bring it into our own lives. So let's talk about how microbial communities work together to adapt and survive in the world and make a living. And there's a basic organizing principle that I want to impress upon you. And you all understand it, it's intuitive. Okay, you've even heard about it today. It has to do with the social network. So you've heard of symbiosis probably. And if you haven't, I'll just tell you, it's another word for cooperation. I think everybody in this room understands intuitively and out there in the world that cooperation is the key to doing things that individuals can't do on their own. Aristotle said it, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And microorganisms figured this out a long time ago. So as individuals, we can do so much. As populations, we can do more. As communities, we can do even more. And as we go from that individual state to interaction states between members of a population, between members of a community, the scale at which we can impact the world increases by orders and orders of magnitude. And that's why microbes working together in the ocean can change the earth, can engineer the atmosphere. So I just want to give you an example from my own life, kind of how I became aware of this organizing principle in the first place. So what you're seeing here is an image of two types of microorganisms interacting with one another. There's the red and the green. Okay, so these microorganisms live in the deep sea. They live in sediments on the coasts, the world's oceans. 
And when I was a postdoctoral researcher at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, I was given the job of using environmental DNA sequencing to try to understand this symbiotic relationship. And why is that important? It's a pretty picture. Well, it turns out that these microorganisms working together literally burn methane, burn it, in the absence of oxygen. Okay, that's interesting. Why is it important? Well, if these microorganisms working together did not exist in the sediment, there would be 300 billion more kilograms of methane in the atmosphere. That's a big number, so let's put it in perspective. A blue whale weighs, uh, what, 140,000 kilograms? That's about 2 million blue whale equivalents per, per year that these microorganisms consume. And really, if they didn't do that, the Earth would be a different place and you and I would not be here. Because methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than even carbon dioxide. And so this study, this experience, scientifically, really opened me up to the power of cooperation in the microbial world. This message from the mud resonated with me as I moved forward in my career to really think about what are the organizing principles and how can we use them? Okay, cooperation is key, but what does that really mean if you're going to engineer a biological system? So let's go back to our symbiotic chart and put a little bit of more detail in there. Okay, so metabolism. We're going to talk a little bit about metabolism. Think about it like this. It's a series of reactions that can build things up or break things down, right? And individual cells, of course, our cells, any cell, has a lot of metabolic reactions that are going on because that's how the cell maintains itself. So you see, this is the ABCs of metabolic cooperation. In the single cell, that yellow cell, I'm showing you a series of reactions. Now, it becomes more efficient under certain circumstances to split that series of reactions and share the process between multiple members. So in this case, we have population level interactions where A to B to C is carried out in one cell and C to D conversion is carried out in another cell. And that can create a much more efficient process. At the community level where we start to distribute those transformations across even more members of the community, we increase that efficiency even more. Remember I told you there's a scaling effect as you go from individuals to populations to communities. And so the question is what does this remind you of? Well, to a certain extent, it makes me think of an assembly line. So microbes, not Ford, invented the assembly line. And they did it billions of years before Ford was born. And the point is, it's an even more efficient kind of assembly line. Because as I told you, not only are you building things here, they're building cars. They're working together to do that efficiently. But microbes are really good at breaking things down. And so in that sense, during that metabolic process, the waste products of one reaction become the starting points for other reactions and the community can efficiently recycle its energy and materials. So how do we harness it, right? It's one thing to tell you that microbial communities are a life support system. It's another thing to tell you that microbial communities cooperate. Of course, you know that there are other sides to that coin, but I want to emphasize the cooperative. How do we take that power and use it to make our lives better? So this is the crux of the issue. I told you, we have to move beyond oil. It's a non-renewable resource unless you live for billions of years. We just don't have time to wait because the earth is changing. Our life support systems are changing. So we need to move beyond that. So this is an example of a biorefinery. So you can harness microbial communities to do all sorts of things. You can build wastewater treatment plants. You can do bioremediation. You can put them in landfills to clean up methane. But one of the most potent applications of this cooperative theory of metabolism is in the biorefinery. And we have biorefineries. They're coming online right now. They make biofuels. So here's a biorefinery that uses corn as the starting point, as a renewable feedstock to make ethanol. The problem is these types of plants are just not that efficient. The ethanol that is produced from the renewable plant material is not cost competitive with oil. And therefore, how do we get over that hurdle? How do we transform the economics so that we can actually use renewables, like plant material, not only as sources of energy, but also sources of materials 
to build our world. The problem is that plant material is hard to break down. Okay, what we want to get are the polymers. We want to get the cellulose, we want to get the lignin out of that plant. We can grow that plant sustainably, right? While it's doing photosynthesis. So there's a real benefit if we can just make this work. But getting those polymers into smaller constituent parts so that we can make ethanol, biofuel, or make various materials, biomaterials, is extremely challenging. So how do we bring the microbial world and the problem-solving power of cooperation into that set? We need a search function. We need essentially a Google, a biological search function. And so my lab actually works on trying to find ways to reach into natural environments, to take the environmental DNA from the microbial community that's already interacting to solve their energy and material problems. We take that DNA and we put it into a domesticated cell that we can grow in the laboratory. And then we find ways to get that domesticated cell to turn on the genes, the environmental DNA genes that are present in the microbial community. And we can screen these domesticated cells that carry environmental DNA for different functions, for the ability to convert lignin into small molecules that can be used to create building materials, or to convert cellulose into sugars that can be used to create biofuels. And what we can do with that is actually pretty exciting. Because borrowing from those same cooperative design principles, we can take different pieces of genetic information and we can engineer communities of microorganisms that can convert that biomass, that plant material, into biofuels and biomaterials very efficiently. And we can control based on the type of plant material and based on the type of thing that we want to get out, based on the community, based on the assemblage, based on the engineered system that we've built based on these design principles. Okay? So let me wrap it up. We live in a world that's dominated by microorganisms. This sequencing revolution has shown us this. We've come to understand that microbes are successful in large part because they have learned over time to cooperate, to share the burden. We can take that genetic information from microbial communities and we can transfer those naturally engineered genetic parts into domesticated cells. We can use those cells to create biorefineries. We can program that ethanol plant with this genetic information to work more efficiently. So now that we understand that microorganisms are the dominant force on the planet, we can use this awareness to not only evolve with respect to our own ability to engineer, but to make a conscious choice to change the way that we live, to change the way that we consume. And so the next time that you take a breath or the next time that you fill up your car with gasoline, or even the next time you use anything made out of plastic, just consider how the microbial world makes our lives better. And think for a moment about the awesome power that's all around us. It might be hidden, but that power has real solutions for sustainable living. Learn from it. Learn about it and embrace the possibilities. Thank you.